Hi, Jake. Thanks for joining us. Hey and hi, hi, everyone else who's joining us for our webinar series today. Um, before we get started, just a few housekeeping things. Just a reminder that our next webinar is going to be October 19th, same time, same place, 12 p.m. It's going to be on dementia and firearms with Dr. Emmy Betts, who's an ER doctor from Colorado and an expert on this topic. So um, keep your eyes out for the registration in a follow-up email. And you can also find today's recording, um, a link to it. It'll be posted on our website and will also be in that email. Um, we have a Q&A set up for this rather than the chat. So if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A for the webinar. And um, if it's something real easy that I can answer quickly or a tech problem, we'll respond to that just by typing the answer in. But then at the end, of Jake's presentation, we will, um, I'll, I'll ask some of the questions and I'll try to get to most of them if we have time, but I may sort of put some of them together and combine them and let Jake respond to some of those. Um, and then we will also have beginning and ending polls that helps us collect information about who our audience is, what they know, what they wish they knew, and how we can continue to update our educational information so that it is the most useful to all of you. So thanks everybody for coming today. We're really excited about our um, presenter today, who's Jake Whiskershen. He's a marriage and family therapist and a national certified counselor. He runs an organization called Zephyr Wellness, which is an outpatient counseling agency in Northern Nevada. Jake's also a lifelong gun owner and he works and sits on the board of Walk the Talk America, which is an organization to, um, to improve people's mental health. And he helps them create curricula designed to improve cultural competence from mental health practitioners while inviting firearm owners into the counseling realm without fear of judgment or stigma. So we're really glad to have Jake's expertise in um, firearms and the firearm community combined with his mental health background here to teach us all a little bit about firearms and um, how their uses, their reasons for ownership and what they're all about. So thanks so much for joining us, Jake. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dr. Barnhorst. Um, I am coming to you at uh, was this noon Pacific, and the skies are clear, but the smoke is rolled in. So if you're not from the West Coast and you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, we're ravaged by fires now. So we could uh, we could use your prayers, not just to clear the air, but obviously to, to knock down the fires. Um, I have uh, been invited to give this presentation. Be really short on the uh, intro. Um, Amy covered it. I do own a bunch of firearms. I've been a gun owner my whole life and I come from a family full of cops. And so uh, when I found Walk the Talk America as a licensed clinician, I realized this was a great opportunity to bring two cultures together. And so I met up with Mike Sedini, who's the founder and we had a podcast together. I also have a, a mental health podcast called Noggin Notes. So he came on there and we talked for quite a while and then uh, we became very good friends afterward. And uh, the last two years, I've been really ha happy to help the organization move and advance its cause because what we found over time is that gun owners are skittish about counseling. So as Dr. Barnhorst mentioned, I do develop curriculum to help practitioners to understand the culture in firearms, and that's part of what I'm going to go through today. But the flip side of that coin is to demystify the counseling process for people who may be struggling and don't want to come in because they are skeptical, they're suspicious, and a lot of those people have known guns because they have uh, been led to believe wrongly in most cases that practitioners will just take their guns if they're depressed or they're struggling with anxiety or whatever they're doing. So part of our mission is to invite that group in and it's all for suicide prevention because if you struggle on your own and you don't get help, uh, you end up taking your own life sometimes and oftentimes that happens with a firearm. So I'm not gonna bore anybody with statistics. You all know most of those things, but what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna walk through a series of uh, guns that I own or have been loaned to me. And then I'm gonna talk about storage mechanisms as well. And all this is designed to improve your own cultural competence and your understanding of what it's like to work with a firearms owner if they happen to come into your setting, whether you're primary care or emergency medicine or outpatient therapy, you know, talk therapy like I do. We want to have a reasonable working understanding of the language so that we don't chase people off when they're seeking care. 
So uh, that all being said, I'm going to be showing weapons on the screen. It may, you know, disturb some people. That's okay. We're all safe. And you just, you kind of got to take my word at it, but I'm going to show you how they're safe, how they're all disarmed and, and uh, there's no ammunition in them or anything like that. But, but I will be, you know, muzzle flashing the camera and that's not um, unintentional. That's not careless. It's, it's intentional. I want you to see all angles of these firearms so that you can envision in your head what they look like when you're working with somebody. So I'm going to start with uh, low caliber to high caliber, and we're going to start with like probably the lowest caliber anybody's heard of, which is a BB. Um, and these BBs, I'm sure you've seen them in movies. They're little tiny guys. I'm going to try to hold this up to the camera. <laughs> It's 4K, hopefully it picks that up, looks like it. If you see me looking up, it's because I have a TV mounted to my office here. Um, so these little tiny guys are not very big, but they can do some damage. And they typically shoot out of something that either looks like this and can be a BB gun. This is not a BB gun, this is a nine millimeter. Um, but more often you're probably familiar with something that looks like this. And I rock this back and forth and you can hear the, the chattering of the BBs inside. This is typically what kids get as their first rifle. Um, they can come shorter or longer uh, for, you know, size of child, but you probably all remember that movie where, you know, um, you know, don't shoot your eye out, uh, don't get the BB gun. This happens to be a pump action BB gun. So you pump this a bunch of times, it charges the, the pressure inside, and then uh, you pull the trigger and a BB shoots out the end. Some of them have a lever underneath and that just is spring loaded. It cocks the, the BB into place and then uh, you shoot it and you can shoot these at paper. Uh, you can shoot them at animals or, or like small creatures, birds and squirrels and stuff. So people sometimes use them for hunting. I happen to have attached a laser on this one. And this is where I get to muzzle flash the camera and you see that laser go by. Um, that is a common optic that we put on a lot of firearms that helps us align very quickly where we want to shoot without actually having to stare through uh, you know, some, some sights or a scope or something. So this one happens to have a laser on it. Um, and uh, it is legal to shoot ground squirrels, as it turns out. So I'm going to set that aside. I'll come back to it in a minute. We're going to work up to uh, a pellet. So from the BB, we go to the pellet. And these are a little, little heftier, and uh, they're, they're a little more streamlined. You can see that what I'm holding there, it's kind of got a pointy shape to it, if you can see that on the camera. Um, just slightly under the 22 caliber, which is one of the more popular calibers of firearms, a pellet is also spring loaded or pressure loaded, or it could be shot with carbon dioxide gas. And I happen to have a pellet gun here. Believe it or not, this monstrous looking thing is actually a pellet gun. And this is called a break barrel. So what you do is you break the barrel open, stick your pellet inside, you'd cock it all the way down and then put it right back into place. And now it's spring loaded and ready to shoot. And it shoots very fast. This can shoot up to 1200 feet per second. And that will become relevant in a moment as I go through the rest of these. But, you know, it looks very menacing. It looks like one of those black, you know, rifle shaped things that uh, we've been taught to be afraid of, but it just shoots this little guy. Now that doesn't mean it's less lethal because if put in the right spot, you could do some serious damage with a pellet. Um, also used for small game and target shooting and fun things like that. That one happens to have a scope on it. So I mentioned it's uh, it's slightly below the 22 caliber. So I'm going to hold up a bullet here. This is a 22 caliber bullet. Uh, 0.22 is the measurement. And uh, usually that we're, we're talking in inches there. So this is 0.177. So 17 hundredths versus 22 hundredths. They're, they're almost almost identical in size that the 22 is a little fatter right um i'm gonna go through something real quick here that's going to be useful so the bullet comes basically in uh two parts there's there's the slug at the top or what's known as the bullet and then the casing so all together we we call this a round right um i've got a round here of a nine millimeter that's separate so this is this is the slug that was taken out of a, a gun range here locally that I just uh, picked up and carried home because I thought it was neat and I thought it could use use it in demonstration. Turns out I can, and this is that demonstration. So what happens is when they make these things, you'll notice on the bottom here there's a little dot right in the center. That's called the primer. The primer is what's used to spark the gunpowder that's inside. And what happens is the gunpowder burns very fast. It creates a pressure that ejects the um, projectile, which is this, this slug. So when they're, when they're put all together, you know, they look something like this or like this. This is a put together nine millimeter. 
So in this particular one, there is no there is no primer on the on the back end. You see there, it's called a rim fire, meaning you can strike anywhere on the bottom of this this bullet, and it'll it'll spark the gunpowder and it'll create pressure, and that'll that pressure will cause the slug to discharge. So there's two different types of ammunition there. There's center fire, which is the primer type, which is almost every piece of round you'll pick up, and then there's rim fire. So you, why is this relevant? Well. It's cool to know, and it gives you some, you know, language. I don't know if it's useful in the clinical sense, but where I go with this is if you're a suicide interventionist and you happen to be talking to somebody on the phone, you don't have eyes, uh, you barely have ears because you got the phone and they're ideating suicide and they're ideating suicide with a firearm. And oh, by the way, the firearm is handy. Um, they may say something like, oh, I'm just, I'm just messing around. It's, it's just a rim fire. It's just a rim fire. It's, it's just a 22, right? It's just a 22. It can't do any damage. Well, this, this will kill somebody. Um, placed properly, eyeball, uh, side of the head, ear, um, even under the chin, uh, this will kill a person. So don't take lightly that somebody's messing around with a loaded firearm or even a loaded spring powered or air powered firearm, even though they're not technically firearms, such as this. This can do some serious damage. Um, you know, I know back in the old days, kids used to shoot each other with BBs and it was all good fun, but uh, we don't we don't do that anymore. We don't talk like that. We don't condone that. It's it's irresponsible and it's reckless and dangerous. So uh, if you happen to be engaged with somebody who's ideating suicide with a firearm and they say it's only, uh, it doesn't matter. Same lethality applies uh, as far as we're concerned as interventionists, as practitioners. So uh, let me show you what a 22 goes into. So this is a Ruger. Uh, this is uh, my dad's old gun. He, um, he actually had this uh, handed down to him from his brother, my uncle, who died by firearm suicide in 1983. Uh, this little guy shoots really well. Um, you, you, you can neglect it. It accumulates a lot of dirt. It's a great gun. Um, you can see the bolt is open here. There's nothing inside. There's no magazine in the bottom. So we know this is safe. But this little bullet would go inside here, and uh, this is the, the, the bolt mechanism that pulls back, and I'm going to drop it off of safety here. Now we would have something chambered, and you pull the trigger, and the gun would go bang, right? I don't have anything in there, and it's important to know because this is the magazine that would go in. It does have bullets in. I'm not going to insert it all the way. I'm just going to show you that it goes in the bottom, and if I wanted to, I could you know slide it all the way in until it goes click. I would then load it by pulling this back, right? And uh, dropping it into place. And then we would have a round chamber. Now, if you're, again, in the spirit of suicide intervention, if you're dealing with somebody who has a loaded gun, you want to know terminology. How do the bullets get into the gun? A lot of what we're gonna talk about, this happens to be a semi-automatic pistol, uh, has to do with magazines. So this is a magazine that goes into the gun that feeds the bullets. Semi-automatic means that every time you pull the trigger, a round cycles through, the casing ejects, you know, the, the empty case that I showed you, and you can do it again. Click, 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 or I should say bang, 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 until it goes click, and then you're empty. That's what semi-automatic means. It means that every time you pull the trigger, a round cycles through until you're empty. Automatic means you pull the trigger and rounds keep firing. Automatic weapons are not legal. Uh, so we wanna be very clear on our terminology that automatic weapons are not legal. Semi-automatic weapons are absolutely legal. Um, why is this important for intervention? Well, you may say, all right, hey, so you're on the phone with your suicidal uh, ideating person and they say, uh, you know, I got, I, got a, I got a gun, it's a semi-automatic. I don't know what it is, it's my dad's, right? Let's pretend it's a teenager, it's my dad's semi-automatic. I just picked it up out of the closet. Um, and you say, is the magazine in there? They go, no, 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 no magazine in here. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just considering. I'm just considering what it'd be like. Well, here's the thing. There's no guarantee that there's not a bullet in the chamber. And that's really important to know because unless you open up the bolt, lock the safety into place and hold it there, you don't know that this is unloaded. Just because there's a magazine pulled from the gun doesn't mean it's empty. Let's go on to another semi-automatic. A uh, very popular one called the Glock. So this is a Glock frame. Uh, you can see that it's empty. There's nothing in here. There's no no magazine, right? Um, same concept, right? You put a magazine in the bottom. Magazines look something like this. This happens to hold 17 rounds. This magazine happens to hold 33 rounds. It fits the same. And I have another one over here. 
happens to hold 50 rounds. It's a drum magnet. All of these will fit into this pistol. If you put a magazine in and it's loaded and you drop the slide, you now have loaded the gun. So just simply ejecting the magazine does not make the gun safe. We want to make sure that if we're talking to our suicidal subject, we say, hey, why don't you set the gun down? That would be the first thing to do. But if they don't want to do that, you can negotiate with them and say, all right, take the magazine out. And there's always a little button you can push somewhere on here that ejects the magazine. And uh, the magazine falls out. All right, set that aside. Now pull the slide and lock it into place. All right, so anything that's in there, once you open the slide, will eject out. Now we've, you've made safe the gun. Now they can they can play with it all they want. Uh, presumably that you know they're they're being honest and you're you're talking to them on the phone and and they're following what you're saying. And you don't have to say set it aside, right? That comes later in the conversation once once you've earned their trust. But in the meantime, you can say, hey, disarm the thing, get get the bullets out, right? So that's a that's a Glock. And there's lots of different types of Glocks. They're all different sizes and calibers. That one happens to be nine millimeter. Uh, let's go to a revolver. So you hear the revolvers probably. This one is, is safe. I'm gonna point it at me and then I'm gonna point it at you. That looks unsafe, but I'm showing you that there's no, nothing in the cylinder here, right? So the cylinder is where the bullets would go. And when the bullets go into the cylinder, it goes in like that and locks into place. And similar to the semi-automatic concept, every time you pull the gun or every time you pull the trigger on the gun, it goes click, 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 right? Okay, and it rolls around until all five of those rounds are spent. And then there's a little little mechanism here that pushes down and will extract all of those those casings. Well, if you're dealing with somebody who has a loaded revolver, you can say, open the cylinder, push out the extractor, or you can just shake the bullets out sometimes. Uh, sometimes they stick. And then you've made the gun safe and you can set it aside. And now you sound like you know what you're talking about, which is really important. So you want to ask questions if you're doing suicidal intervention or or um, or even prevention. So uh, I'll, I'll touch more on that in a minute. But in the meantime, I want to show you what that round looks like. So that is a 380. And um, that's uh, my dad's old backup duty weapon. He was a police officer, too. Um, so the 380 and the nine millimeter look very, very similar. They're very close in size but you notice how the casing is is longer right so the casing is longer on the 380 because it's got more gunpowder in it meaning it, it sends out a faster projectile we look at something like rifle rounds these have even bigger casings still so a lot of gunpowder and it sends that that round out quite fast so if you're trying to knock down things like human beings, if you're a police officer, or if you're in war, you're, you're in the military, or you're a hunter and you're trying to knock down large game, you want a longer, bigger bullet to get the job done. And that's why we, we build in those types of things. So uh, longer casing, more gunpowder, faster. Uh, yes, it's more lethal, right? And we'll get to that in a moment. So we talked about the, uh, the, the pistols. Now let's move on to rifles. And I'm going very, very fast and I apologize. One other thing, one other type of gun that this 22 guy can shoot out of is a rifle. So this is a 22 LR caliber uh, bullet or designation bullet. So not only does it go in that pistol that I showed you, this one here that was the hand-me-down, uh, this is also hand-me-down. This gun was built in 1932 and it is a single shot. So right here you see the bolt, there's nothing in there. Uh, the bolt would close on your on your bullet um sorry open up the bolt <laughs> bolt would close and now you're ready to fire right so you'd pull this thing back pull the trigger and a round comes out the gun goes bang and every time you want to do that again you have to extract the thing put a new bullet in close it pull so this is very laborious but um this is also used for small game and also target shooting uh, like i said it's been around for a really long time it doesn't come with a lot of bells and whistles the way you aim this is there's a, a, a rear sight and a front sight. You line the two and, and shoot. Uh, but you notice it has a striking similarity to this guy, right? So if a kid is playing with these, they may not know the difference. And like I said before, this is really dangerous. The BB gun is, is dangerous. Like we can, we can cause harm with this. Not compared to this though. This shoots actual fire powered rounds. So we want to be 
we want to be treating all all gun looking things with equal respect, especially when we're talking about youth who may not know the difference. So I'm gonna set that aside, and I'm gonna pick up a different rifle. Also, my dad's. Also, a hand me down. This is a 30 out six. Looks a lot like the one I just put on the camera, except this one shoots this big giant bullet. And if we compare them, there's really really not much of a comparison there. I mean, it's I mean, you can see how how the size difference plays out. Um, this one is for hunting deer and elk and all sorts of things. So same concept though. Every time you want to shoot, you have to open the bolt, pull it back, put a round in, close it, open it, hold it, right? Um, if you wanted to, you could put a magazine in here that holds three or four rounds, and then you don't have to hand feed the rounds, but either way, this is not a semi-automatic because every time you want to shoot, you have to open the bolt, close it again, fire, open the bolt, close again, fire. And if you fired more than two times, your deer has run away, uh, speaking from experience. What else is long? All right, shotgun. This is a Remington 870 shotgun. You can see the bolt is open there. Um, nothing is inside. The rounds in this one feed through from underneath. So you stuff a bunch of rounds in here, but again, not semi-automatic. Now there are some semi-automatic shotguns that are magazine fed. And if you stick a bunch of, of rounds in there, you can just go bang, 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 keep pulling the trigger. This one, you have to eject the thing, load in a new one, shoot, eject the thing, load in a new one, shoot, eject it. You get the point. Um, shotgun rounds can come in all different shapes and colors and um, and loads as they call them so here's three different shells that i have this one is spent this one you can see there's nothing inside also center fire meaning it has a primer you can reload these uh, i have a reloading machine that i got from my grandfather i haven't used it yet because i haven't learned how but it looks like it still works um, these are both 12 gauge um, probably can't see that on there but uh there are different gauges of, of shotgun shells and those are, those go by size. So uh, width basically is what we're talking about or, or uh, diameter. 12 gauge is normally the commercially, the biggest one you're going to find. Um, they have bigger ones for, you know, boat hunting and that kind of thing with very large birds or something. Um, but they go down uh, uh, the, the interesting thing is there's a, there's an inverse relationship with the gauge size and the size of the round. So a 12 gauge is large, 16 gauge is a little smaller, 20 gauge is a little smaller still, and then a 410 gauge is smaller even than that. And they're all used for different purposes, typically bird hunting, because what happens with a shotgun shell, and you can see how it's crimped on the top, what they've got are a bunch of little BBs, um, and they can be BB sized, or they can be smaller than BB size, or they can be very large. This one I don't know if it'll show up on the screen, but this one has very large pellets inside of it. And I'll get to that in just a second. But the idea behind a shotgun is that you've got the same gunpowder in here. Then you have a wad that packs the powder in. And then you have shot that sits on top of the, the wad. And then you fold this in and crimp it. And when you strike the, the primer, same concept. Gunpowder burns through very rapidly, creates gases. Those gases expand. They shoot out the wad and shoot out the shot. Now, if I have a bunch of little pellets in there instead of one, you know, large pellet, what happens is as it hits the air, it comes it comes down the channels down the the barrel, hits the air, and immediately friction is applied, and you get a spray pattern out of that. So. The further away you are, the larger the spray pattern, but also the less kinetic energy behind those pellets when they hit something. So if you're going bird hunting, uh, you want a spray pattern because you're trying to catch the uh, as much of the bird as possible, right? Well, for home defense and for um, law enforcement purposes, the same concept applies. You can hit a larger area with a single shot than you can with just one round from a from a pistol or a rifle. So shotguns are used for, useful for home defense, which is why some people choose this buckshot. Now buckshot draws its name from when people used to shoot bucks with these things. You can also put rifled slugs into shotguns and um, you, can, you can shoot very large uh, pellets out of them. So think about if you're trying to defend your home, uh, sh some people use shotguns as the primary mechanism because, yep, six minutes, because they, uh, they cover a lot more ground. So um, 
there's the shotgun. All right, now let's get to the big menacing AR platform rifle. All right, so empty, right? This is a semi-automatic firearm. It shoots this guy. I compared it to the 30 out six earlier. Why would someone want this? Well, same thing. A lot of people like home defense. Uh, you can shoot multiple rounds with an AR. Uh, it's, uh, it's outfitted for platform. Uh, sorry, that platform is outfitted to do lots of different things. You can shoot long distance. You can shoot short range. Uh, you can shoot one round at a time. You can shoot 10 or 30 or 100. So um, that's gained a lot of controversy lately because it looks menacing and they call them weapons of war and all that stuff, but it simply stands that it's the most popular gun that we have on the market today. So with the last five minutes, I, I'm sorry I got so long winded, there's just a lot to cover. We wanna talk storage. So if you're talking to somebody in your office about firearm storage, I really invite you to consider the following um, word responsible. We wanna get away from the word safe. Safe has become watered down over time and uh, people use it uh, interchangeably with lots of other things. And we don't all agree on the same definition. You talk to gun owners, a lot of them believe they're the safest people on the planet. So you say, are you storing your gun safely? Somebody may say, yeah, absolutely. I'm storing my gun safely. And what they mean is I've got seven of them staged around the house in various shapes and forms. Uh, none of them are locked up. All of them are loaded and chambered. And I have kids running around to them. That's safe. Cause they think that, you know, ISIS is going to kick in their window at 3 AM or something. What we want to say is responsible and responsible means preventing unauthorized access. I have here a safe that I keep in my truck. Um, it's got a locking mechanism on it. So all I do is I, I touch this little guy and it lights it up, well, hopefully. And I go, you hear the, the lock and disengage. I open it up and here inside is my concealed carry gun, also a Glock. Okay. Um, very user-friendly. It's called a quick access. Thing. So if somebody says, I don't have safes around, or I, I only have my big, tall stand-up safe, which I couldn't bring because it's like a thousand pounds, you might talk to them about a quick access safe. Um, something that we're trying to pr promote with Walk the Talk America is the use of quick access safes. And we say, you should practice getting into your safe as often as you practice putting rounds down range on target. Because if you're serious about being responsible and keeping everybody in your household safe from predators, intruders, whatever, then you should practice getting into that safe as often as you practice throwing rounds down range. Here's another safe, same concept. This one takes a key. There's another concealed carry. Whoops. There's another concealed carry gun in there. That's also a Glock. Um, but this one takes a key. And then finally, I have a different quick access safe. This one happens to have either or combination or biometric fingerprint. Now this one's not set up for my fingerprint. It's a demo model that I borrowed from Reno Guns Range. But the one, two, three, four, five works. And as soon as I hit it, I'll pop my glue gun. This is a plastic one. We use these for like police academy training and so forth. And you just pull it back up. You can anchor this to the side of a desk. You can put it in a car. You can put it um, pretty much anywhere you want. Um, and just by practicing, I'm gonna show that again because it's cool. So there's no reason to be storing guns loaded, chambered around the house. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, trigger lock. Uh, so we got, this is another small gun. You can see it's, it's unloaded, um, but this locks the trigger. And I have the key dangling from it to show you what happens here. But basically, I just twist the key, the lock comes off, and now the gun's ready to use. This is great for preventing uh, youth access to your firearms, too. So... Um, We've got two minutes left. I got a lot more to say, but I'm going to shut up and see if we have questions. Awesome. Thank you so much for all that, Jake. That was, it was great to hear too, how like you might actually use some of this knowledge in clinical practice. That's really helpful. Um, before we get to questions and we have a couple already of good ones in the Q and A. And so feel free folks, if you have other things, um, that you want Jake to address, feel free to put more questions in the Q and A. We're going to, um, launch the poll that I, forgot to launch before we started the presentation. So we're gonna do just the opening poll and the closing poll together now. So we'll take a minute for those, thanks. Once that goes away, I'll show a quick demo here. So you hear a lot about cable lock and how people should use cable locks and cable locks are mandated. Uh, the way a cable lock works is you thread it through the, um, the open chamber here um, and down through like you go through the the mag magazine well 
uh, there we go, and then lock it up, and then the the, the slide can't close. Uh, I'll just be quite honest. If you ask people, you know, people in the gun community, if they're using cable locks, you'll hear a an emphatic no. Uh, they're they, they just don't get used very often. Um, they're kind of a hassle. The keys are very tiny. The locks are sort of unreliable. Um, people don't like. They think they scratch the insides. They don't, but but they think they do. So. Um, if cable lock is your first default go-to when you're asking about safe storage or responsible storage, um, you might just want to skip over and go, hey, do you have a biometric safe? <laughs> It'll make you sound cool. Um, but also it, it ups their game a little bit. Sorry about that, I totally forgot. Oh, uh, we have, since we're on the subject, I'm, is that good enough time for the poll, Ramesha? Yeah, it looks like great. Thank you everyone for um, responding to our poll questions. It's really helpful to us. We have a couple more questions about safe storage devices, one of which is, um, what kinds of locks are good for long guns, like shotguns, rifles, and AR-15s? I have a, a key, a, a trigger lock here for my shotgun. I just didn't present it because I ran out of time, but this, this goes to the shotgun. So I would recommend that, but also if you can't afford a safe, if you're buying a gun, buy a safe. It's just part of the deal. It's like buying a car, buy, buy car insurance, um, buy a spare tire, you know? Um, but if you can't, because safes are not super cheap, I mean, Costco has them for like 500 bucks, but still 500 bucks, get one of these. A lot of times they'll come with your purchase. That one on my pistol came with the purchase. This one came with the purchase. Um, and we have another question of what, what storage device, you address this a little bit, but maybe you can say more about it. What do you think gun owners are most receptive to using, especially balancing the risk for self-harm with quick access? Um, you're, you ask that to 10 different people, you're gonna get 12 different answers, but um, these these are super popular. These these quick access safes, especially the biometric ones. Now, some people say, well, you know, what if the battery runs out? Well, that's why you have keys. Um, there, there's always, you're always gonna get a yes, but for the people who don't wanna use them. But I think what they're most receptive to is a reasonable conversation that meets them where they are. Uh, you don't pretend to know stuff you don't know, you don't fake it, and you certainly don't. <laughs> get judgmental about you know, firearms owners. Uh, don't say you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, that comes off very clunky and, and off-putting. I know this is something that um, I think you and I have talked about before, this concern about getting mental health care for folks. And this is particularly relevant now with people who are coming out of the military, who are over in Afghanistan, with the number of recent police officer suicides um, from the folks who were respondents to the Jan January 6th um, assaults on the Capitol. That there's a lot of risk in law enforcement and the military and a lot of firearm ownership, but there's hesitancy in seeking care because of this belief that, that you know they'll take my guns away, they won't be receptive, they'll be judgmental. So how can clinicians let potential patients or clients know that firearm owners are welcome there and that it's sort of a culturally competent practice? Um, I think, I think it, I'm going to back up, up just a little bit. I think it starts with command staff at the various places where those people work and making a a culture that's uh, inviting of seeking care. But as far as what we can do personally, if you're talking about retired uh, military, law, retired law enforcement, uh, or just gun owners in general who are struggling, what we have to do is we have to return to our ethical principles and our, and our legal mandates. Um, we're supposed to go up a ladder of intrusiveness when we're talking about you know care intervention strategies, right? So you go least intrusive method possible. Well, the same goes for intervention. We're not going to reach right for hey get you, get rid of your guns. We should say how are you storing them? Who are you talking to about this? Um, you know what what can we do differently? If they're in that acute of a situation, the next level of intrusiveness is not to take somebody's property or to um, you know, try to try to get them to to get rid of their stuff. It's to get a higher level of care, right? So if that if that's voluntary, that's great. If it's involuntary, that's the next best thing. Um, but I, I I cringe a little bit when I hear people stretching straight for implementing ERPO laws or or um, you know seizure laws because uh, those are just rife with mines. Uh, it's, a, it's a minefield of liability and and potential litigation. So I think what we need to do is we need to say. I'm, I'm, although I may be given the authority under law to uh, ask a judge to take your guns away, my first line of in intervention is to get you well and ask you to, you know, get away from them in a responsible way, change the lock, hand them to a trusted relative, um, have, get your spouse on board, you know, the, any, anything that's less than that. So as long as we communicate that and say, hey, I'm not, I'm not allowed to breach your confidentiality. 
uh, for any reason besides imminent risk of threat to self or others. And if that's the case, I'm, I'm not calling the deputies, I'm calling the, the paramedics to get you to the hospital. Um, that's what I've found successful. And that, whenever I give this presentation, if it, not this presentation, but when I'm talking to gun owners, there's a collective sigh of relief that says, wow, we've never heard anybody talk like you. I'm like, yeah, man, come into my office. I'm not just going to take your stuff because you're struggling with anxiety and you like to go plinking in the desert with your kids. I'm not calling CPS over that. That's great. Yeah, really keeping it about like getting the patient better and helping them rather than, you know, focusing on the guns. We are um, out of time, but thank you so much, Jake. And thanks to everyone for your great questions for Jake. We'll stick around for a few minutes. I'll hang out other ones that come up. Um, but we appreciate all of you coming and don't forget to register for our next webinar uh, with Dr. Emmy Betts on October 19th on dementia and firearms. And Emmy's great. You should totally take that class. <laughs> I, I set this up. Like I spent like an hour and a half setting this up, so I'm not going anywhere else. I'll, I'll stick around. <laughs> I really appreciate it. I love that you borrowed some stuff too. So thank you so much. We have, we have one more question since you're still here, Jake. Um, and it's from someone who asks, do gun owners feel that criminal liability should be legislated if a firearm is not secured responsibly and someone is injured and killed? Uh, I can't speak for all gun owners, but I, th I think that that's it. we need to have that conversation. I think for too long, just given a, I'm just gonna give a, a, a back on, on what I've learned through gun culture since joining Walk Talk America. I was never really, part, even though I've owned guns my whole life, I wasn't part of the gun culture. And I've learned a lot in the last two years. And one thing I will say is that they've spent so long defensive on their heels, um, anticipating the next attack on their, their constitutional rights, that they never bothered to move forward with any conversation for fear of believing that if you even entertain the concept of mental health as being conjoined with firearms ownership, then they would uh, seize the opportunity to step in and steal your rights or something. So, so there's this great hesitation, not even to engage in dialogue, which I think is a, a crying shame. But I think it's time to have that conversation and see, you know, like, see how to go about that. Because the, I think the easy answer, the, the low hanging fruit is to say, well, just pass a law that everybody has to lock their stuff up at all times. It's like, well, that's not reasonable. Like I'm a concealed carrier. My stuff's not gonna be locked up at all times. It's on my person. A lot of the time. Um, so writing those laws, and I know because I've, I've been involved in some of that process, writing, writing various laws, writing those laws almost always inevitably triggers unintended consequences. You write one law, you think you've got it done, but then you, you forgot about a whole bunch of what ifs that, that nobody else brought up during the, the sausage making process in the legislature. So um, that's probably not the way to go about it. Um, Washington, I know, just did something like that. But as far as penalizing people who, who store irresponsibly, like if you're, if we're not able to self-police as a community, then somebody else has to step in because we're, we're losing kit. I mean, I don't know if anybody subscribes to the re re dash aim on Twitter. Re aim is a, uh, about responsible and safe gun storage. And um, it's gotta be three to five times a week. I see some tragic story about a kid accessing a firearm that was improperly stored and shooting somebody either to death or, to, to the hospital. And that's just unacceptable. Like, you, I mean, I just, I can't, I can't, I can't get my mind around it. It's like handing my the keys to the car to my six-year-old. Like, why would, why would I do that? Like, it's just, well, he knows better. No, he doesn't. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Developmentally, they don't. So something has to be done. We need to start talking about it. So I, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. I don't, you know, I want to save lives, man. You know, the less government intrusion, the better probably, but hey, if we got to have government intrude, well, Thank you so much for being here with us and for bridging this gap and talking about this stuff because it's really, really important. And um, thanks to all of our attendees again for attending and asking great questions and filling out our survey and look for your follow-up email with the registration link for the next one. Yeah, and uh, I really appreciate you you having me on. It's uh, I mean, I'm always honored when I get to share this kind of stuff, but I want to leave my uh, contact info. If anybody wants to reach out privately, because uh, this there's a lot more to say. Uh, Walk the Talk America is doing a lot of great work with regard to reaching out to firearms dealers, uh, the, the, the retail stores, the ranges, instructors, uh, sending flyers out and, and, and wristbands to say, take a free and anonymous mental health screening on our website. Um, there's a lot to do and to say. So if you want to follow up with me on that, uh, Jake, J-A-K-E at ZephyrWellness.org is how you get a hold of me. I'm pretty accessible. I don't really hide from anybody. So um, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, if you love the presentation, uh, 
buy me a beer if you hated it. Uh, just keep the nasty comments to yourself. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you all soon.